Okay, hello. I think we're live. Oops, wrong button. <laughs> okay. Just, I accidentally disabled the microphone. Okay, I think we're live now. Just gonna fix some of the real estate on the screen. Here's some of the topics we're gonna go over today. So Houdini 19 was released on October 27th, which was, uh, let's see, two days ago. So the Steam release, which is, uh, so Houdini is sold on the Side Effects website and on, you can buy it as a Steam app. So I, I bought the, the one on the Steam app. That one was released at the end of the day, really late at, during the evening of the 27th, like, I think 8 o'clock or nine o'clock i'm not sure i found out really late so that was a little too late for me uh but i went on the next day and started playing around with uh houdini 19 actually on the 27th i started downloading the apprentice because i couldn't wait for the steam app to come out like it just took I, I just got really excited so i started playing around with this apprentice version and just to familiarize uh just to try out some of the new features and uh yeah until i could wait for the steam app to be released later on that evening and i started playing around for the next couple of days for yesterday and i came up with some samples so this one i'm still working on the ragdoll partial loose <coughs> sorry the partial ragdoll partial loose ragdoll full and stiff and the motion line i can't figure out where they put this um, this is the motion line and physics one where the you see the guy uh, Actually, let me pull it up <laughs> uh, So on my blog, I also have a bunch of links um, With the topics from the previous launch video. So this is the launch video what we saw on last week ish and I have these little links these links are actually time links they're time stamp links so it'll start exactly when the topic not exactly but approximate um spot in the video according to whatever topic i indicated in the link so this just helps me find stuff uh the one that i was mentioning the one this i couldn't find I don't know where they placed this feature, which is the one I'm, I think a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'll just grab it. Oh my God, where is it? <laughs> Motion line physics. Oh, here it is. Okay. Which is just this guy. I couldn't find this feature. Like, I wonder where they put it. It's it. I know it's in the Kinefax. I just don't know which node they placed it in. I'm guessing it's in the rig pose node, but I couldn't figure out how to get this uh, to show up in the UI or, or how to, how it works. So that's still um, uh, on the list, outstanding on the list. And the ragdoll partial, I haven't f uh, fully figured out how this part works either, This which is with all the ragdoll constraints and the newly added ragdoll solver, which is really exciting. Uh, I did get a chance to figure out the key pose extraction so that's something that um we're gonna go over today so i have a few examples this curve note i must say this the new improvements to the curve note really uh blew my mind because when i saw the launch video with the curve note it didn't seem as um it didn't blow my mind as much but then when i when it was released and i started playing around with it i was like this is mind blowing. It feels like Illustrator, but in 3D. And th th it feels awesome. So, started playing around with it. I, I haven't done much with the curve note, but I can. I have a lot of ideas in my head. I feel like, so I was trying to do, let me show you what I was trying to do. So I did this little really basic, really, really uh, embarrassing little robot. So first, I drafted the robot with boxes. So I'm gonna swap this over. So this is what it looks like before the curve node. Oh, minus the feet. The feet looks terrible. I should disconnect this. 
That's the fee. So I drafted something super simple. This was just to, to test it out, okay? It doesn't mean anything. It's an embarrassing little biped robot. And then I tried to think of ways on using the curve node to replace some of the uh, parts. So I wanted to replace the feet. Uh, the bottom lower lower part of the feet with using the curve node to do something fancy like curviness to it. So this is what I got. Let me template. Let me template this, and let's go over to the curve node. So this is what I started off with, like trying to just playing around with the curve node, trying to get a nice, um, interesting shape. And this is amazing. I must say, the curve node is so amazing. You can, you can even like it's even non-destructive. However, the non-destructiveness of the curve node isn't as um, isn't as uh, great as I would like it to be. Like, okay, so this is the beginning of the curve node that I drafted out, and then say we want to extend this by adding another curve node, like uh, parenting it. We're going to go like this. And I want to um, expand this, like keep on working on this curve node by adding another curve node on it for the Houdini non-destructive workflow. So say I go like this and I want to continue this over, maybe make this 3D, make this plane 3D, like draft, draft the cross section of here. So I'm going to try and do something like this. Pick a point and draft it maybe curviness like this I don't know and then like hopefully like try to get something okay that's probably better try to get that as a cross cross section and try to like continue it on it's actually not that it, it's not that simple to do so say I'm going to continue this curve keep going and keep going Oh, uh, let's make this simple. Let's go like here. And then finish it. It won't connect it. Like it, it won't connect all these curves together and create that plane for you. If I were to create another curve like this, it creates that plane for you. So I was hoping that we would, if we were like connecting parenting curves, um, one after another, that you could continue this on and you can really make something 3d like a 3d geometry just with the curved node but unfortunately i don't know if there's like something special you have to do to it or something i couldn't get these curved nodes or this curve line to share between two planes so that's something i really would love because you can really make some awesome mechanical uh components or mechanical parts with this okay Hey, Tom. Uh, let's see what else. So this, this curve node really blew my mind. So let's go over some of the really a uh, simple user face with this. Now let's be, let's start with another one. Something fresh. So drop down curve node, press enter. Well, move your mouse, hover the mouse over the viewport, then press enter. And then you get all this, uh, this little tips on the left hand, uh, upper left hand corner, and then you get your red dot with your mouse cursor on here. Now make sure you have something selected up here, like either this pen mode or this draw mode. Now, if you had this selected, you you can't really make new stuff. This is for selection, so this is just selecting stuff and tweaking curves. This is actually editing the curve. And this one is just drawing to your heart's content. Like you can, it'll allow you to draw more freely. This one is the pen mode that I really like because I really like these uh, Bezier handles. So click it once to create a curve, let go, and you get your Bezier handle. Uh, come over here. I don't know. Say you want uh, a funny curve. This makes opens up possibilities for creating really, really nice, complex shapes. You can still move the camera. Hold down Alt. <coughs> Sorry. Hold down Alt on your keyboard and then uh, just pan, rotate with uh, your, your mouse. Like whatever you, because uh, I have the right hand, I have the right hand button 
enabled on my mouse, which is something you have to really uh, go into the environment variable and actually change the flag to. It doesn't come by default. So the right hand, right mouse click is something you have to enable in the environment variables. But anyways, pan or uh, rotate whatever you want by holding down the alt and then do whatever with your mouse to rotate. And then you can, so left click once, gets you that first uh, curve node then you get you see your bezier handle now you can click and hold left click and hold you can see you can um adjust your bezier handle for the second node and this will create a nice interesting curve so let's create something okay let's do something like this okay let's continue this on Let me move the thing. And say I want a sharp corner. I want this to sharp, like have this flat. Then you can come over here and choose one of these guys. So you want a sharp corner, then just choose this guy. This is like the sharp corner one. And you can see it turns into a square. So now when you click, <coughs> sorry, now when you click this, uh, I think you can, okay, sorry, you can double click it and it'll turn into the square and that gives you a sharp corner. So you want to switch back, you can double click it again, I believe. Okay, let me come over here. <laughs> let me do it the hard way. Select this, select this node, uh, select this point, come over here and change it to a curve node. Oh, I think I need both of them. Okay, there we go. I had two two dots laid on top. That's why it was being difficult. Now they're not connected. Okay, let me just go back to this. I'm going to middle mouse click this to choose it. And you can actually drag it out. Now I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Usually, the last time I did this, it actually moved the mo the moved the dot. I think it's because I had this. Okay, let's start fresh. <laughs> I completely messed this one up. This click, click drag, click drag. Click drag, okay. Now I wanna turn this into a sharp turn. Double click. And click, click, click. But now I wanna turn it back. Draw. Shift control. Okay. So I guess, let's see. Okay. Let me do this one more time. So we can click. Click and drag will give you a bezier handle. Click and drag, bezier handle. And if I want a sharp corner, I click once without dragging. I always thought it was a double click. <laughs> I guess that was funny. <coughs> Sorry, I think when I was double clicking all the time, I was adding two dots on top of each other. So let, let's do this one more time. Click, uh, let's end that curve first. Click, add one, click, add new point, click, drag, bezier, click, drag, bezier. One click, single click, no dragging. And you get that, uh, the sharp one, the sharp anchor, anchor line. Click once. Click drag, it turns back into a bezier. And then let's just end it. Now, if I want to turn this this point into like this sharp anchor point into a, a bezier handle, I believe it's just like this. Yeah. And then it turns into a bezier handle. Whee! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
uh tom uh new curves are a major boon. it is i was very i was very delighted um and very surprised at this how how well it felt actually uh, while playing around with it watching it during the launch video didn't seem as as awesome but playing around with it really feels really awesome Year 2021, Houdini gets busier curves. Yes! This, I can't believe how much fun this is because it's in 3D. Like, we can actually do a lot to this. So let me just um, erase everything else I have there. So I'm going to click the select. And then I'm just going to select everything and delete it. Now we have this weird shape, which is not... This is a pretty complex shape. Uh, which isn't very special in terms of Illustrator. If you've ever used Illustrator, this isn't too special. You, Illustrator has had this um, since ever. But this is Houdini. We can do this stuff in 3D. So we can like poly extrude it. We can... Uh, let me do it back. Okay. We can... Hmm... Well, my favorite one is the poly extrude. I just keep poly extruding it like crazy. Uh, insecting it. Oops. So I'm going to choose this. Okay. And I'm going to choose this side. These two sides to insect it. I think I went a little too far. Let's go one. Then I'm going to use... Uh, and edit. Let me come over here. Exit out of this. Escape. And then come over here. Choose the cursor. Choose a uh, face. I'm going to choose this face. Uh, highlight that. And then press T. And then I'm going to pull it out just a bit. And I get that little nice curve or chamfer on the edges. Which you can actually do with the bevel node. But I'm not very good at using the bevel node. I never really understood how that worked i'll show you what i mean if we try to bevel this like from this point sometimes it doesn't work for me poly bevel let's give it a try oh before the inset so before insetting it so let's go up here so this is like other stuff so this is the plane shape that we got and I want to try and poly bevel it. Distance here, round chamfer divisions. It doesn't give me that clean topology. Like you get these little um, weird connections here, I guess. Which is not something I really like. But at least it worked this time. Because <laughs> the last time I did this, it didn't really work. I'm not sure. I, I don't really get the bevel. <laughs> but at least it worked. But I want you to notice that this this topology here. And the topology that I create over here. It, it, this, to me, is a lot cleaner. Because it, it's more straight. Like, we have these lines going... Uh, one way, like there's no triangles or anything, except for here. You got triangles here, but that's that's too pointy. So, uh, loving these new features. Yes, me too. Rod Rodeska. Uh, I could kiss the man who added bevel <laughs> bezier handles. Yes, I I totally understand what you mean. What a pleasant voice. Oh, thank you, Eugene. And the fact that we can do multiple curves in one go. Yes, yes, I know. And if you hold control over a point when you're in curve edit mode, you can redrag the uh, handle and edit it. Oh, let me see. Was that what it was? Hold control. I don't think you need to hold control. All you have to do is go into this Curve mode. Let's see. Let's see. Control, insert new point. Control, repull tangents on point. Repull to oh tangents. Oh yeah, that's one more thing I wanted to talk about. Okay, say we want to make this anchor point a little curvy, but I want it be to be curved evenly. 
Oh, actually, let me create a new curve to illustrate that. Click the point, click, click, one click, because I want a sharp corner, sharp corner, sharp corner, and then bezier it, uh, I don't, I don't know, uh, bezier this, and bezier that. Now, there's one thing I want to change, is that this, okay, uh, okay, let's go with that. Lower. Okay. Now, if I want this, this corner and this corner to be like evenly rounded, and let's round up this one too, to like round up evenly all together. You can highlight them, highlight those, uh, those points. Come over here to this guy, or this one. I like to use this one. Create rounded corners, and then you get this, um round adjustment <laughs> i don't know click and drag this little circle and look at this nice curved shape you get we're just like rounding everything this is awesome this is very hard to create in with uh, before the curved node was in these new updates came up so this is a really complex shape which we can do loads with it in 3d what a pleasant one. Uh, and the fact, uh, and if you hold control, in the point, yes. Uh, but I don't think you need to hold control, but I had to switch over. Maybe it's because you're in pen mode and you hold control. Let me try. Switch pen mode and then hold control. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> Repull tangents. I'm not sure. Oh, wait, it switched it again. Control. I am not sure. <laughs> I'm still learning the curve, uh, the shortcuts. Uh, tell it to exclude, to exclude an angle. Oh. Okay, let's choose everything. Exclude this. No. Let me see. Oh wait. Uh. This control. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm not sure. Click on exclusions. Do, do, do. Retract. Expand. Delete. I don't see it. Hmm. Oop. Let's see. Go to exclusion. Turn it to like 45. What do you mean in here? Hmm. Let's see. Insert mode Bezier. Tract. Oh. Not sure. Uh, activate it and then change the angle. Activate this. Sorry, let me go back to selection mode. Click this and you can this. Yeah, I can do this, but I don't need to. Let's see. Break tangent handle while dragging. Control. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. Control. Oh, okay. Join it back. Okay. So this... Oh, I see what you mean by control now. So you can select... Okay, go into cursor mode. Select any of your existing uh, points. Click this. So this is a, a curvy um, anchor. A, a bezier anchor. And then we want to turn it into one of those, sh the sharp pointy anchor ones. C hold down control and click this, one of the handles. It'll break it apart. And if you want to join it back together, I don't know the, the shortcut, but if you click this and you click this little, uh, these icons, this one, it'll join it back together. So then when you go like this, it's it's one piece. It um, These two handles are together. 
I wonder if you can project this geo onto a surface and edit as a part. You can, you can, using the rain node, you can. This is the beauty of this. Um, let me project this weird shape onto a sphere. Okay, that's new. Create sphere, primitive sphere. I just gotta find my sphere now. <laughs> Let's make it really, really large so we have more area to project. Okay, too large. Okay, so I'm going to project this curved node onto that sphere. Okay, let's come to this curved node. I'm just going to delete the bottom one first. Okay, let's drop down a rain node. So rain, the rain node is used for projection. You can project one thing onto another. So let's take the geometry, ray points or primitives, and then collision primitives. Okay, so collision primitives should be the sphere that we're trying to project to. And the points we're trying to move, it would be the curve points. So I'm going to connect this. Turn on the rain mode. Take out the template. Uh, template the sphere and then ta-da <laughs> sometimes the rain node doesn't work as um well as you want so you can specify the the vector that you want to project in the direction of and in that case come to the rain node uh come if the rain node's not doing what you want try you can try doing this you change the method project rays instead of that oh actually it is project rays direction from so take out the normal and choose vectors. And then you can specify your own vector. So we're going to take this out. And I'm going to project this. Um, so we can see here. If you have this little widget here, you'll see that this is the x direction. This way is the x direction. So we're going to project this guy in the x uh, negative direction this way. So if you look at this little widget here, you'll see that the X is pointing that way, that way, this way in the positive direction because this is red over here. This part, the opposite way should be negative. So if we go negative one, it'll project it this way in the right direction. You, you'll have to learn how to read this little guy in the bottom. I think it's a little hard to read because I have the background too dark. I think that's a little better. Ah, oh, that's that's much better. This little guy over here. Uh, let's see. That'd be sick. Yep. Projection is definitely there. I think we'll need more uh topology though. If you can look if you look carefully, it's not projecting it as as great because it's estimating we don't have enough points. We don't have enough points on the curve. So what we can do is uh, resample the curve or you can convert the curve node into um, into into a polygon or some sort. So let me just resample it. So we've got more, more dots, more topology. And then let's see what the projection looks like. It's still not great because we don't have enough topology on... Uh, the plane itself. You can see that this is one single polygon. So there's nothing to bend. It can't bend, literally. So let's go here. Let's convert this into polygon. Or we can just remesh it. I think that's best. After the curve. Okay. You need to be careful that you're not losing the shape. So it's nice to have come here to remesh. And I like to put hard edges and I just go like, take everything. <laughs> and then lower this a bit. Have nice topology. Okay, let's try the ray now. I think this will have a more accurate ray. Yeah, this, now it's more accurate. But our now our sphere doesn't have enough topology. So you can see these flat spots here, flattening here and here and there. That's because the sphere doesn't have much topology. It's it's like 
pixelated. It's low polygon. So let's turn up the frequency. Here. Oh, sorry. Sphere. Let's turn up. Uh, where are you? Uh, rays. Let's go insane with this. Okay. Okay, that's more smooth. Now you got like a smoother... Let me drop that in null note so I can have a better visual on this. Okay. So that's nicely curved. That little... I hope you can see that this is nicely curved. Compared to what it was before, which is this flat curve. Completely flat. Oh, the exclude angle is on the uh, poly. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I thought everyone. I'm a little slow on the comments, so I was like wrong timing. Oh, yeah. I really don't know how to use the poly bevel. <laughs> no, I meant the poly uh, bevel note. Oh, I'm so slow on these comments. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Off. <laughs> the uh, control. I think they meant the click control on the tangent not the point <laughs> yeah i'm so sorry <laughs> i i got that uh, a little later it, it is the tangent handles the little handles um everyone's talking about it's just that i was so slow to read these messages um click this uh yeah click this so you get this little this tangent handle if you click uh hold down control you can break this out so now i have the pointy anchor thing if you want to put it back together, I don't know the shortcut for that. But if you highlight this and you click this icon, it'll put it back together. <laughs> there you can go uh, the curve control tr trick. Yeah. Uh, Rodeska. Uh, they. Dag. <laughs> Sorry. I'm trying to read your name. I hope I didn't pronounce it incorrectly. Uh, it's the uh, bevel known. Yeah, I'm so sorry. So slow in the comments. Uh, Rudeska, hey dude, love your sculpt work. Oh, uh, oh, hey, thanks. Sorry, resample the that curve. Yeah. <laughs> it is it possible to marry software? Is that too taboo? Hmm. I have to add side effects. <laughs> yeah, I think side effects has to give you permission to marry to marry Houdini. Yeah, remesh better the uh, surface pro uh, project. Yeah. The remesh does wonders. <laughs> Topology is king. You can really change. Let me see if I can flat shade this. I think it'd be better if I reverse this as well. Because the, the normals are flipped. Okay, that looks a bit better. Now turn it back to dark. So we can have a better view of this nice curviness. <laughs> Nothing is a table with Houdini. <laughs> Jessica, hi all seeing this is I just have an idea of creating a planet <laughs> and then we can blow it up with the new pyro uh features so I'm just gonna move on to the next one because we have a lot of stuff to go over that was just the curve that was just the curve there's so many like updates for in Houdini 19 um one of the things uh, is... Let's see. Let me see the topic list. Let me go in order. Uh, the Vellum Unified. So much features uh, shoved into the Vellum Unified uh, multi-solver. Just to give you an idea, that is this stuff that they were talking about in the launch. This stuff. Uh, we have, I believe this, this, uh, wheel, turning wheel, the, uh, is baked, uh, is baked animation. Um, let's see. The barrels are not baked. I'm trying to rewind. So the barrels are being pushed by the fluid. The grains floating on top of the flip fluid. It's, it's not flip fluid, sorry. It's vellum fluid. <laughs> and then we have cloth. We have cloth tearing. We have cloth, uh, vellum cloth. Um, 
uh, floating on top of the the vellum fluid. So I was actually very surprised when I first watched this. My imagination went wild. Like I started thinking of oh, city destruction with with grains uh, as debris blasting here and there, and then water flooding and stuff. The this is actually suited for small scale scenes, not for large scale scenes. So if you're thinking what I was thinking, like large scale ocean explosion or city destruction, that may be a little more difficult. But if you stick to something simple, like something like this, uh, it, it's very, very nice. It's very fast. That's what I like about it. And let's take a look. Let's take a look at the simplified vellum version. It's gonna cook because oh, I'm on frame three. Just give it one second. Uh, thicken subdivide. Oh, for the uh, for that plane for the curve plane. Rock on. There's a little tent icon right. The viewport to turn off back face tinting in the view options. Oh, okay. Ah, nice looks. We are gonna have ten hours of stream. <laughs> I hope not. I'll I'll be like, my voice would be completely destroyed. But it'll be much, very, very fun. Maybe we can have another stream in a couple of days. <laughs> we'll spread it out. <laughs> let's see. Okay, let's let's take a look at this. This is really exciting because for those of you who have done. Uh, simulations in Houdini, we know that it has been a pain to create, um, to make flip fluids interact with uh, RBD. Well, that's not too bad, actually. But flip fluids interacting with uh, vellum clothing or interacting with, um, uh, who knows, vellum with RBD, vellum with uh blah, fracturing fracturing rbd or vellum balloons with rbd or let's see flip fluid we can make a water balloon using this oh that that just clicked in my head i should have did a water balloon <laughs> okay anyways let's let's go here so uh in the video oh let me just uh let's start with this let's start here I'm inside the geometry contacts and I wanted to show you if you type in in the SOPs type in vellum and then type in uh, vellum configure you'll see all the list of items that we potentially can create now so we can the balloons always been there so that's nothing special the class always been there but however what's been added is the uh, configure fluid configure grain configure hair so hair has always been there so what's more special is the fluid and the grain and the newly improved vellum solver that can work make all this stuff interact with each other in real time so, in order to illustrate that, let's just add it into a simulation. Let's just add everything that we can into the simulation. So here I have a torus. Just remesh it, just to get more topology. You don't really have to remesh it. <coughs> uh, this is for the balloon. This is so the balloon, uh, that bounce balloon, so we have that cloth. So this is nothing too special. It's just cloth, pressure, and this is the default. So all you have to do is just drop down this node. Configure cloth. Or I think it was configure balloon, sorry. Vellum configure balloon. That's the one I used. So that was that's just this. And I just hooked it up. Now you have the output balloon and you have the output constraints. So this will just give you something simple like a balloon for the which was I was doing for the rubber toy to bounce on it. So we have our uh vellum balloon, then I created a vellum fluid. So we start off, I use the same torus, um, moved it a little higher, and then just connected it to the vellum fluid. So that's just doing vellum configure fluid. So that's just this guy. Drop it down. You can connect any geometry to it and it'll turn it into a fluid. So you get your fluid particles. So you can adjust the, the, the voxel si or particle size of the 
fluid right up here in the vellum fluid node. Uh, I have 0 0.05, so it's not too extreme. But you have to remember to check this. Create points from volume. If you don't have that checked, we won't. We will not get our flip. Uh, no, it's not flip anymore. It's called vellum. It's fluid particles. You don't get your fluid particles. So you need that checked. Uh, you can also uh, change this to grain. So this is um, so it's sharing the same uh, same node. So all you have to do is just change it to grain for grains. So I'm just going to keep it as fluid for now. Now let's go into the dot net. Oh, there is one. Okay, I'll I'll go over the RBD. So this is there's a little trick to it that I learned from uh, Tim. Tim, Tim. So I wasn't sure how to do RBD in with this new fancy Vellum Unified uh, Solver. So I actually had to ask someone online, and then he taught me how to use the shape constraint in the Vellum constraints in order to fake out the RBD, and that's a really cool trick. So, but let's just go over this first. I just want to go one step at a time. So we have fluid, and we have that balloon we hook it up just as the same thing how we hook up any kind of simulation the vellum balloon so this is just the balloon and the constraints so let's go over here this is the balloon so this is the first two outputs first is the geometry balloon and then the second one which is the middle purple color output which will be the constraints And you just uh, plug that path into here, into the vellum object, initial data here. So if you go hit this, vellum object, that's what you need. That's where your initial data goes. Uh, we do the same thing for the fluid. So here again, we have the fluid geometry and we have the fluid constraints. So the fluid geometry would just be the particles. So let's just take a look, just really, really quickly. So this is the fluid. The first two, again, the first two outputs. The first one is the geometry, which is the fluid particles. And then the purple output plug is the fluid constraints. Go back to the dump net. And that's what these two are. Now, this is just super simple. Everything's connected to the first input of the vellum solver. The vellum solver, I don't think I have anything special. It's just default, uh, default parameters. Uh, let me double check. Oh, I did turn up the substats. Uh, so this is turned up to three. So originally, uh, by default, it's value one. Plugged in some gravity, so stuff can happen. And added a ground plane. Okay, let's just play it. Oh, it is bouncing because I added a rest blend to it. That is another thing I read, too. Oh, no, it's not in this one. I think it's, uh, sorry. I think I know why. Because I was experimenting with this. I might have this in the wrong spot. Rest balloon, rest constraints. No, it looks good. Because the, the bounce was not, oh, I think the ground is too high. That's why. That's why it's bouncing. Because the ground is clipping the balloon. So let's lower the ground. <laughs> yeah, the ground is just clipping it. So it's pushing it high. It, it's colliding with the balloon to right on the beginning, which is way too early because it hasn't even had a chance to land. Okay, this is better. Let's try that again. Okay, there's your little balloon bounce. There's the fluid splash. Now, the best thing about the fluid is that, okay, so here I have my dot net, uh, dot import. So this works exactly the same thing how you have your simulations. You have your dot net and you have your dot import. The dot import extracts the data from uh, the dot net simulation and in back into the SOPs. So this is the SOP land. This is where we are in the geometry context, geometry. Uh, Inside this dot net is where all the simulation magic happens, where all the 
math computations happen, but that stays in the dot net. And what you want to do is you want to extract all that data out and bring it into the SOP world, which is where we are over here. And that can be accomplished with a dot import. So drop down, dot import, drop this down, and it needs to know what is the dot network. So that's this guy. Click and just drag and drop it over. Now, object mask. So what do you want to import is what it's asking you. Well, this object mask is referring to this, these objects, whatever you plug into the first input of the Vellum solver. It's usually the object to process. Now, later on in the next example, I will show you that um, this gets a little more complicated when we throw more things into it. But let's just go over this first. Um, so let's say we want the balloon. So I named this balloon. So over here, it says object name, dollar sign OS, which is grabbing the name of the node, which I named it balloon. So you could go like this. You could go like balloon, like that, that works too. Or you can just go dollar sign OS, which grabs the name of the node over here. So let's go over here. Let's type in balloon. Okay, it's still not working. We're still getting an error. We'll come over here, import style. What do you want to import? Let's fetch geometry from dot network. Okay, there's our balloon. And then if you play it, you'll see it bounce, but you'll only see the balloon. So we're not, where's the, where's the fluid and where's all that stuff? Well, you can always put it over. Um, I wonder if we can do this. Yeah, we actually can. We, you can put multiple objects here. What I usually like to do is have it separate, like create another dot import object and then uh, import it separately. Or you can just put, if you want everything to import all at once, just put an asterisk. It'll import everything, including the ground. But I actually don't, uh, sorry. Uh, no, but I don't want the ground. So I want to exclude the ground. And let's just play it. There you go. Now, what I want to show you about the flip fluid, or not flip, I keep saying flip fluid, it's vellum fluid, it's not flip, it's, it's not flip anymore, it's, it's inside the vellum world. Anyways, here's the uh, fluid, and I'm going to change um, uh, in fluid, if you remember this guy, this particle fluid surface, it converts the fluid particles into a polygon geometry so you can render it more easily. So that's what it does. Let's check it out. And it converts all that fluid uh, particles and it'll try to give you an estimate shape of the fluid. So this is something that you can render with and create like uh, throw down a water geometry, a water material. So let's just play this one. So that's the splash. This can be improved uh, a lot better by playing around with the voxel scale. So this would be like how far you want to estimate. Um, it's looking at how far you want to use. How much resolution of a voxel do you want to use to estimate the size of each uh, area of the fluid, if that makes sense. It's using volumes to estimate, uh, to convert the f fluid particles into a polygon. So it does require a voxel scale. And influence is how much influence is your na nearby particle going to affect your next particle. If you have this too turned up too high, you're going to have all the particles followed, un unified very closely, and you won't you're, you're going to lose all that noise, all that stuff. And if this value is too low, you're going to get too much noise. So you have to be careful with that. You have to play around with these settings to get the look that you want. But be careful if you change some of these, uh, pump up the values too much, it will start to take a toll on the performance. So you have to find that sweet spot. Uh, let's see. So this is everything. And that's what the water, uh, water shader, water material shader. 
which looks awesome in the viewport. So this is just in the viewport. Splash. All right, let's talk about the RBD. So at the beginning, I struggled to get RBD working with this new Vellum Unified um, multi solver inside the vellum. I was like, because there was no RBD. If you go like vellum configure, there is no RBD. So I was trying many different ways to get this to work. And then it wasn't until I got really tired and I started asking someone. Oh, do, do, do. Just trying to find. Uh, sorry, just give me one second. Let me pull them up. This guy, when I asked him, and uh, he's one of the presenters on the Hive. And then he taught me how to do... Uh, RBD with the how to make RBD work with the new fancy vellum uh, unified multi solver this fancy thing so say we have this um, geometry and I want to turn this geometry into a rigid body and inter have this all interact inside the sim same simulation uh, let me Okay, it doesn't matter. Let's see. Transform, just move him a little, make him a little smaller. Uh, turn him to cloth. And then use the shape match. So this sort of fakes the rigid body. The shape match will maintain maintain uh, this rubber toy's volume. And maintain his shape. Until the constraint breaks. So it adds a vellum constraint saying maintain this shape as best as uh as much as you want depending on the stiffness that you have on the, depending on the values that you have configured in this constraint so we have a pretty high constraint over here with 10 but i i have noticed that the constraint still breaks on these horns it breaks really easily uh, probably because the horns are the thinnest uh smallest parts in the rubber toy and then again, we have these outputs over here. The first output is the RBD. Well, I named it RBD. It's not really RBD. It's uh, vellum geometry. Really, really hard ge uh, vellum geometry. <laughs> and then the second one is the constraints. But I'm just calling it RBD here because that's the what I was trying to do. A rigid body material bring it into the vellum simulation the same way that we do everything else. Just drop down a vellum object and then I, oh, connect the two uh, outputs that I have shown you just a while ago, the out RBD and the uh, constraints. Feed it all into the simulation And this, let's just run it. It just works just like that, which is awesome. Thanks to the new improvements on the Vellum Unified Multisolver. And I would never have figured this out if it wasn't for Tim. So thanks, Tim. <laughs> I have no idea how he figured that out. That, that's amazing. I never would have guessed to use the shape, uh, shape match constraint. So as you can see, the horns do break. So the constraint is starting to uh, break right there. It breaks really easily, probably because the horns are too small. So you can see that the rubber toy is interacting with the balloon. Like, it's squishing down the balloon. Just give this a little bit more time to cook. And we can re-watch some of this. Uh, that fluid is running on... It hamster wheel so cute when pets get exercise. <laughs> we can actually throw in kin effects and see how that goes. And create our own hamster wheel. 
uh looking forward to seeing everyone push the limits of fl fluid grains and i i i can see that coming too i can see someone trying to do the the ocean scene using vellum sticking going going out and buying more ram sticking it in i wonder if it uses pc ram or video ram vellum fluid sim super slow it can be it is true it can be but there is a lot going on if you have everything here Oh, okay, let me disable the constraints. I don't want to see it. Okay, let's rewatch this. Okay, you can see that... Oh. The rubber toy is squishing down onto the vellum balloon it's pressing down on it so you can see the vellum balloon sort of uh force being forced downwards squishing on so it is interacting is what i'm trying to say so our fake rbd object and the balloon is interacting and then comes the flip fluid which is also interacting with everything else because we see the splash So it, it's all working together. It, the unified uh, multi-solver is working. Now, I turn this simulation and I turn it up a notch. Because I wanted to test it a little bit more. So in this one, which is the another one, a different simulation. But it's based of the... I started off with this simple one. And then I took this and I tweaked it a bit more. So here we have the relatively the same setup. We have our RBD, uh, fake RBD rubber toy. Then we have the balloon sphere. I no longer have a torus sphere because I wasn't sure if the rubber toy was just landing in the middle of the donut or like the hole in the radius of the donut. So I just, I, I just created a sphere instead. And there's a reason for this because I'm going to, uh, the sphere is now going to initially start off as a deflated balloon and I'm going to inflate it in the middle and have it bounce and throw everything up in the air just to see everything really interact. And this is the same, uh, flip, not flip, <laughs> that's going to sting for a while. <laughs> this is the same vellum fluid that I have set up as just as before. I also threw in some hair just to see if the hair would interact. But unfortunately, the hair does not. <laughs> so I threw some hair onto uh, the rubber toy just to see, like, just to see everything interact. But it just completely ignores the hair. <laughs> it just falls right through. So um, the multi slover does not work with hair yet. Let me go in. So the way you set this one up is a little different. Because I'm inflating the balloon, I need a vellum source to keep feeding in a new uh, force, in, in a new um, a rest blend. It's, it's called a rest blend. It's a force that tells it, okay, I'm changing the shape of this balloon constantly as you play the animation. And I need to constantly feed in a new force. So then in that case, you'll need a vellum source instead of just putting everything. So this is the vellum source over here. It's going to... Sorry, I wanted to raise this up. So we can get more real estate. So this is the vellum source over here. And this is the vellum object. That what that's what we were using the whole time. We were using the vellum object to feed to set up our simulation. We fed everything as a vellum object. But now we're gonna do it differently. We're gonna use vellum source. But even if you have you're using vellum source and you're not gonna be using the vellum object, you still need to add it in. You still need to create a vellum object. It needs to have something there to allocate as an object. 
uh let me just check out some of the comments uh if donuts could bounce like that <laughs> that's the guy that made houdini 101 oh yeah tim tim is the one who did the houdini 101 or houdini or something i can't remember no no yeah he, he uh he is tim is amazing yeah he is let's do it hamster fluid <laughs> That rubber toy has been through his paces. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> I know he gets paid well at side effects. He, he, they're going to make a martyr out of him. <laughs> We're going to put him on a pedestal. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we have... Okay, it will be inflated... Thing. This is where it starts. Yeah, okay. This is where the balloon starts inflating. I waited for everything to fall down first. <laughs> and the rubber toy becomes airborne. By the way, do you work in the industry? What do you do? Oh, me? No, I don't work in the 3D industry. Uh, I used to be a coder. So that was the old life. And then got super bored of it. And then uh, I met Houdini. And then... Yeah, that started a new chapter. <laughs> and here I am. Most of this stuff is for hobby. Uh, would I work for the industry in the future? Who knows? Uh, let's see. Now, uh, the thing I wanted to talk about next is how you export all this information. Again, like uh, I mentioned about the .NET and the dop import the way that you use the dop import this time is a bit different just because well for one thing we only have one vellum object now there's only one object and if you look down here in the geometry spreadsheet inside the simulation so we're inside the dop net we only have one vellum object now let's take a look what the geometry spreadsheet looks in the previous one Let's go back to the simplified version over here. I'm going to stop this. It's cooking. Uh, let's go in. So this is the simplified version. Let's go back here. And this is where we were using a vellum object to feed in the balloon, the fluid, and the RBD. And if you look over here in the geometry spreadsheet, we have a vellum object for the fluid, for the RBD, and the balloon. Well, that's no surprise because we added three different vellum objects over here. So that makes it much simpler or much easier to extract and export, extract using the DOP import, to set up the DOP import. You just feed in everything here. Now, as in, if we're not using a, a separate vellum object for every single for the balloon fluid and RBD, like over here, we're using the vellum source. We're using a single vellum object. We no longer have that separate information over here. We have one vellum object. And in order to use the DOP import and separate all the data out, because if you look over here, if I put have this DOP import, I plug in the DOP, uh, let's do this live, DOP import. I'm gonna drop this down. I want to click and drag. Sorry, let me go here so we can focus on this. Now, I'm going to set up the DOP import. Click and drag the DOP net over into the DOP uh, network parameter. Drop that in. It'll fill it for us. Uh, object mass. Let's just take everything because right now we're not sure what we can take. Um, import style. I'm going to choose fetch geometry from DOP network. That grabs everything. And I know the balloon's there somewhere. Just give it a couple of frames. There it is. However, there's no way of separating the objects now. But if let's go back into the DOP network, we can actually name it uh, differently. So if you go to here, go into the vellum source. So vellum source is something that you drop down. If you want to constantly feed the simulation with different information, with a different force, with a changing force, a force that changes over time, which is the balloon inflating. I want the balloon to get bigger and bigger and bigger over uh, as the number of frames are counting. 
Now, this vellum source, it's set up the exact, it's very similar way. You have a salt path and you have your constraint path, which is the two, the two things, the two outputs that we always had. The first two outputs, the geometry and the middle purple constraint output. So those are just the same thing. It goes in the salt path and the constraint path. We also have a vellum patch name. So this is where it gets interesting. I'm just going to remove that. Let's look at the balloon. Here we have um, we have the salt path constraint. I've named it. I've manually named this vellum patch name balloon. And then if you go here over to the stream, you can also name the stream uh, balloon over here. Now make sure those two are the same. Otherwise, you're just in for a headache. <laughs> just name them the same. That just makes life easier. And I do the same thing for the fluid. So everything's set up the same way. And that's instead of, um, uh, so instead of in here, the vellum object, we had the something similar as well. Uh, let's see, guides. Uh, here, object name. It has a dollar sign OS. That's all. It, like, if you want it, you can do the same thing too. You can come to the vellum source and you can actually just go like, uh, dollar sign OS, uh, dollar sign OS, and then it'll just grab the name of the, the node. So here I have source balloon. So that's the name that it'll grab source balloon, but I'm just going to keep it as balloon for now, but just to let you know, you can have that too. You can do that. Now let's go back to the dot import. Uh, and I want to split this geometry. Like I want to split it so I can actually put a material for a, d a different material for each part, for each component. So let's start with the fluid. How do we separate that? Well, let's, let's drop down a split. Or you know what? I'm going to drop down a blast. A uh, blast. Drop this down. And our stream balloon is over here. It's called stream balloon because I have... Let's let's recook this. It's because I changed that name in the middle. Okay, let's see. Stream. Oh, it does. Okay, so it prepends the stream in front of it. Oh, look, click it. <laughs> Delete non-selected. So now, oh wow, I said fluid. I said we were gonna do fluid. Sorry. Let's do fluid. So that will separate the fluid for us. And if you look here in the geometry spreadsheet for the dot import, so I'm going to highlight the dot import node, scroll over. Well, you know what? I'm just going to filter it over here. Stream. group here it is at the end it's at way at the back here's the stream balloon the stream fluid and the stream rbd so that's one way how you can separate it out so you can also do this for the next one as well let's see stream fluid let's go balloon or if you want the rbd and that's it so that's one way you can do it I want to show you one more thing in the dot net inside. Now this is inside the dot net. I want to show you one more thing in the geometry spreadsheet. So this will come in handy if you're trying to debug stuff, like to show you how to read this uh, this cryptic tree in the geometry spreadsheet over here inside the vellum object. So we only have one vellum object here. It is packing all of this data into it the 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 balloon the fluid and the rbd now if you expand this oh let me let me just pull this up so we have more real estate 
a vellum object. So we're going to expand this. Come over to the geometry. Okay. And we have that same thing here. So if you scroll all the way to the end and you'll see that this is your information here. We have the same data here. So this is how you like sort of uh, hopefully this will help you debug stuff in the future. Uh, constraint geometry is here. Okay. Group there. Okay. So hopefully that'll help in you in the future. Uh, let's take a look at this. What would you, uh, a coder, <laughs> coder as in, uh, coder, this one, coder. I took coats once, once. Uh, oh, actually, I was thinking about switching to coding now. It helps with Vex. It helps, really, really helps you with uh, some of the concepts, like the concept of having a dot net and dot import. This is sort of like marshalling data and uh sorry just give me one second one second
so sorry about that. Okay, now we're back. <laughs> it's it's hard to find a room for like a couple of hours without people. <laughs> oh, let's see. Hey, bubble in chat. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> I love I love the trickle large the funny something. Oh, the that because it's so small. <laughs> it's actually a force of habit. I usually like reading this a little larger. Because the monitor is really large. <laughs> this default size should be like 14 or something. <laughs> it shouldn't be 8 or 10. Whatever. Take your time. Thank you so much. Eggs Benedent. Uh, eggs Benedent. Darn. I got scared. What? <laughs> Pizza arrived. <laughs> no, just random nosy roommates. Uh, so where were we? Geometry spreadsheet. Right, okay. So I think that is the vellum unified solver. Oh, okay. There's one more thing. Uh, oh, I already talked about this. The fluid surface. Adding materials. Not much. Oh, one more exciting thing about this is that I rendered... Um, so for those of you that have seen my Twitter... Oh, that's, uh, I think I posted on the blog too. Oh, here. So I put this on the Twitter feed. Uh, I rendered this in Karma. So that was exciting. I don't use Karma that often. Uh, but the new improvements in Houdini 19 has made it very, very nice. Uh, okay, this is what it looks like. I'll go over the materials. This is super basic material I have set up. But let's go over what it looks like in Karma first. So let's go to the output. So it's very similar how we do mantra. Now I hope this doesn't crash the 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 stream. I really hope this doesn't. So you drop down a karma node, and then you get this. You can choose your output, which is where you're going to save the image sequence uh, data of rendered images. Choose a camera. Choose a resolution. Choose a rendering engine. So if you want the nice fancy karma stuff i'm not sure the difference between these two this is really slow <laughs> this is much better the xpu however you need to know that the xpu is free temporarily i don't believe it's free forever and the reason i say this let's go over to the houdini website i was looking over some over some of the new features of houdini and as, uh, so if you just click on the what's new in the front page, the splash screen on the sideeffects.com, it brings you into the new features that they've added into Houdini 19. If you click Karma, scroll all the way to the end. Uh, over here, they have Karma licensing. Since Karma works with both inside Houdini and as a Hydra delegate in other U USD uh, based applications side effects is planning to bundle un licenses with Houdini core and FX for free. So that, I don't think that in that's like not, they didn't mention indie, the indie license, which is what I'm using too. So I'm using the indie license. So I believe this is going to be charging extra for, for karma in the future. And you need karma to run the XPU engine. Like this, uh, this rendering engine is inside of Karma. So, well, this is gonna be free for another year, uh, an, a year and three months, because we're still in October. Well, we're an, a year and two months, so it will the price will take effect on January first, twenty twenty three. So we still have a whole year. No worries. Uh, right. So, in order to render this in Karma, you need a specific to use specific materials. So it won't work with the mantra materials. I'll show you what materials to add a little later, just let uh, in just a bit. So let's see what it looks like with Karma. So you click this Karma viewport; it'll open a brand new window. Ragdolls. Oh. Let me come over here. Karma Ragdoll. So I had the different... had the wrong uh, camera selected. Let's select a different camera. Uh, Vellum. That's the camera that I want. 
So let's switch it over here. Now, it opens up this window after you press Karma Viewport. And everything is seamlessly linked. So whatever you do here will be affected in this viewport as well. So if we come over here and I actually change the material for the vellum simulation, it, the effect will take into account into this Karma Viewport. So one thing you need to know is that you need to have the uh, render flag turned on. So I have multiple things here. So if I turn this off, you're not going to see it here. Turn it on. There you go. Now this is not Karma yet. So this is just uh, a very basic viewport render. Come over here, switch it to Karma, and magic will start to happen. Now this is a very, this is not very impressive, right? It's because I have this simplified shading checked. Now disable that. Okay, this is way more better. This is what you want. Now I'm going to turn this off before something starts crashing. Because <laughs> I'm streaming and uh, doing that, it's not a good idea. Uh, let's take a look at the materials that I have added. So the material over here. So I have a material network here. Let's take a look. Now this the this is not being used. This is the old mantra stuff. Let's take a look. Now you can see this MTLX. Everything is MTLX. It's actually the same shader. It's the same shader with different uh, color parameters adjusted in the material. So this is MTLX standard surface. They're all of the same. Inside the material network tab, MTLX, you'll see a bunch of new material or uh, material VOP nodes available for you. And so this makes, you can make the material, if you if material shading is your thing, this is, this is, works wonders for you. This is like a kid in a candy land for you, if that's your thing. So the one that I chose is standard surface. It's this, which is more like a, a principal shader in my, in my, in, in my opinion. Uh, I haven't tried much with this because uh, I haven't had time to try much of it. Uh, so I haven't done anything special with this. The only thing I've done used is just the standard surface. And I just changed the, the color, the base, the transmission for the fluid. So the fluid needed to have like, uh, I just pumped this value super high. So it could be more transparent. Turned up the specular. Actually, let's just take a look at the fluid. The water, I called it water. The base chose a really dark color for the oh that's the coat the base um turned up the base chose a blue color specular 0.3 transmission turned up turned it super high so it would be a little transparent uh that's about it so this is nothing really special i've done but this is what you need for karma you need specific materials for it then i just assigned it to the respective um, uh, respective objects since we know how to use oh, we know how to uh, split the geometry from the DOP import using the blast because that's how it's going to be like labeled it, it'll be labeled in groups oh let's see let's see I haven't seen hair set up for XPU yeah I haven't worked on the grooming yet either there's so many new updates uh, where's my topic list? So we're only here. <laughs> XPU license. So I went over that. Uh, I still have to go over the pyro. So this is all the outstanding stuff that I haven't even gone over. This stuff. I haven't had a chance to go over. And I'm still working on the ragdoll. So this is the stuff that I'm still trying out. So it'll probably be another stream in a couple more days. Maybe half a week. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, oh man, Karma CPU is so slow. Oh, or it's slow. Was hoping it might replace 3D Delight. Hmm. It is slow. It is really, really slow. It is true. <laughs> I can't, uh, there's nothing I can say about that either. It is really slow. But it's faster than Mantra. <laughs> Put it that way. 
Well, I'm snacking on a uh, big peanuts right now, and I found two halves of a peanut that fit together like a simple movie. We all found true loves. <laughs> you should take a picture of it and put it on Twitter. Or fix out ins insanity. <laughs> Benedict, I hope that there's a bevel shader in there somewhere. <laughs> there could be. Or, uh, let's see, bevel shaders. Better bevel shaders would you would... Mm, you could do this for the bevel shader as an alternative to the bevel shader. Is put down like a measure, a measure th node. Uh, measure the curvature. Measure the curvature. Curvature here. Just measure the curvature. Uh, it'll give you some sort of curvature data. Okay, let's just plug in the rubber toy. I think the rubber toy is really round. There won't be much. Let's take a look. Curvature primitives. Primitives here. Here's the curvature. So you can feed the curvature into into a vault into the material vault and i think that w might work because i can feed in the curvature here into a color node oops and it seemed like it worked point primitive attribute class attribute curvature Primitive? Why isn't this getting it? Is it on the point? Okay. Well, anyways, there's the curvature data. I don't know why it's not appearing in the drop down. But there's your curvature. You can type it in. Um. So let's make this white. And I want to make this red. So there you go. See, you can actually see the curvature now. All the parts that actually is curving is red. And then you can blend this color. You can use this curvature as a mask um, for your material ball. So that might help with the beveling, uh, with the bevel shading. Oh, I ate it. <laughs> I should have done that. The p the twin peanut. I'll fake it with a uh, Houdini and the new XPU. <laughs> that's that's good. That's a good idea for a small a good exercise for for Houdini practice. Procedural peanut love. You're so brave doing this on a live stream. Oh, I. Mm. Trying out Houdini for the first time. The only thing that's scary is that live stream it might crash. So that that only happened once though, and that's when I was trying the Houdini live link with UE, and I was doing that uh, real time. Like I was actually porting, like sending it over to Unreal this that uh, the same time as I was live streaming, and it crashed Houdini. <laughs> I did it three times, and it crashed three times. <laughs> That was unfortunate. I need a... I probably ran out of video memory. Everything was probably like... Like, uh, eating up the first video card. And then I did some research online. And it turns out everything that you... All the app, the major applications on Windows... Use your first video card. Which is the one... The first slot in your motherboard. There's like your... Which will be the primary... Uh, video card slot and that it 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 uses as your primary like your GPU zero that that's what it names it in the BIOS or something and everything every application uses that so when you're live streaming it's using that to encode all the videos and decode it or whatever and when I'm using Unreal it's using the first GPU as well it's unfortunate that Unreal doesn't let you change the GPU or designate the GPU uh, to do the rendering or to do the work with. Mocap with 
Unreal Engine live link song. Yeah. I want to see that too. Oh, that was in a previous uh, live stream. I might not do that anymore. Just because I couldn't get the live link to work properly. Um, like it works. But the size is incorrect. Which is weird. Because I tried it. I tried the live link. The Houdini live link with Unreal. And I used their default provided hip with the provided mannequin and provided rig that everything it was like the sample file that they provided it works fine it, you i was uh live linking the rig of uh for the mannequin onto the mannequin in ue and i was just, and it works fine everything was perfect however that's not very useful for me so i tried using the oliver teddy that's a like a, a custom character where I made in, uh, I sculpted in ZBrush, brought it into Houdini, did the rig using KinFX, so it's a customized rig in KinFX, used the live link, ported it into Unreal, and that's when things got interesting. Well, not interesting, it just got really, really small. The, the sizes are in, like incompatible. They're just so tiny that you can't even see it in Unreal. But you can see it working because I had this hand wave motion that I was trying to stream into Unreal and you can see the hand moving, but you can't see the actual um, model just because it was so small. So the, the units are messed up and I'm not sure why. I couldn't fix that. Anyways, uh, Lincoln Program always annoying. Yeah. Has anyone switched to Windows 11 yet? Not me yet. Hell no. Uh, hell no. <laughs> uh, I heard is a crap shoot for GPUs. Probably. It'll probably take a long time for Windows 11 to get all the drivers in. I'm going to wait for at least six months. No yeah, me too. I'm going to wait for it. Which really bugs me. Because I'm using Windows 10 Home right now. But the Home version only supports up to 128 gigabytes of ram so if you ever wanted to uh but that actually that doesn't really bother me too much because i only have 64 but if you if you're working with houdini and you really wanted to push your simulations further and more advanced and get more advanced simulations you want to get more than 64 gigabytes of ram which is something i've been wanting to do but ram chips have skyrocketed since the pandemic so that sucks. <laughs> uh, so we're almost done. We're, we have one more thing I want to show you is the pyro. Oh, actually, two more things. Uh, let me show you the uh, kin effects one first. Is the key pose extraction. I think this is more interesting. In my opinion, because I, I, I really enjoy using the kin effects in, in Houdini. Let me just get this the right real estate. So this is, uh, you'll see two things here. The one on the left. So this is a mocap done with my Kinex. It's really simple. I'm just doing like a V sign on my head. Checking it off. And I just do it again. Now, the one on the left is the original one. However, the original mocap already has um, jitter filter so th the application i was using uh, two two connexes and ipsa they provide you with a jitter filter so that removed most of the noise already so the one the mocap you see on the left is pretty good it, it's pretty steady but if you look closer you'll see that the head over here on this mocap let me enlarge this the head on this mocap is a little noisy it's shaking a bit let me do it again let's start on again oh there it goes again just a bit just a teeny bit it, it, it it's like it's a little loose there it goes again it, it's a bit noisy you can see it shaking a bit or jittery a bit and the one on the right has uses kibo's extraction to filter out some of the uh keyframes in the middle and you can see that it smooths out the noise on the head but as someone mentioned on the twitter when i posted it on my twitter account that it also smoothed out some of the motions on the other body parts as well so it's a general smoothing done on the entire animation 
So that can be good and bad. I wonder if there's a way to like focus the key pose extraction and focus it only on a specific uh, joint or a specific bone of the kinefex rig. That would be really interesting. But I don't know if that's possible yet. So, now I'm not going to go over the entire Kinefex, uh setup. What I will go over is how um, uh, go over the key pose extraction part. And uh, I'm not sure if you want to go, if you want to see the configured joints. So there is a limit, limit uh, that I did with the joint. So let me go here. Let me hook up the original one. So the limit, there's a joint limit done over here, this one. So let me bypass this and show you the original without the joint limit. <laughs> you can see that the hand goes right through the body because there's no joint limit. With the joint limit here, you can see that there's a limit on, uh, I've placed a limit on the elbow so that this hand will not rotate beyond this point. So that's really nice. So there's only one limit on one joint. I don't know if you want to see that, but that's not new. Uh, let me show it to you anyways. So that's in the configure joints. So after your full body IK, you can drop down uh, a motion clip. So it needs a motion clip and then it needs to extract all that data out. Well, it doesn't need it, but it makes it much easier. You can drop down a motion clip, feed it into the configured joints. So the first input of the configured joints is you plug in the full body IK. So you have your KinFX set up. I'm, I'm assuming that you know how to set up your KinFX because um, I'm not going to go over the entire KinFX uh, setup that's done in a previous tutorial. Uh, so you hook that up into the first input, which takes the target skeleton for the in, into the configured joints. The third input, it requires a motion clip. You don't have to have it, but in the configured joints node, if you click on this, compute limits for joints from motion clip, that's where this motion clip will come in handy because it'll compute the limits for you. So in, but once you enable it, I just want you to look at this. Your my mocap turned to a splat. Like chaos just happens if you play this. Nothing like that's just everything's uh, really wrong. So just click it and just disable it. And what you'll uh, notice that when you come into the configure joins here, press enter that most of the joints are already set up for you, but they're not enabled. So the one that I wanted to do was the lower arm R, which is this, which is the elbow here. So I clicked on this, uh, what is it? Hold G, click on it. Rotation weights this. Most mass, add a mask. Uh, okay, there it is. Where are the handles? G. Okay, let me do this again. I've lost the handles. I'm going to hook this, the first input to the target. The last one to the motion clip. Click this. Come over here, press enter. Press this. Full body IK regular repose. Okay, yeah. G. Oh, I'm trying to get that handle out. I don't know what happened. 
It was there just yesterday. Mass, center of mass, limits. Oh, sorry. So that's what I was doing wrong. So there's a drop down here. I want the rotation limits. Click that again. G. Oh, it should appear. Rotation's not set, not set. Yes, I'm trying to set it. Oh, there it goes. That's what I'm trying to get. So click this again. Okay. G. Click. Oh, why isn't this doing it? Let me clear the limits. Let me do it again. G. Hold. There we go. I'm trying to get this guy out. So if you're having trouble like me to get this this weird widget to come up, which is your limit ro uh, rotations and translation limits to set onto the joint. So I had a, as you can see, I had a hard time calling it up. Clear the configurations. Inside the configured joints, there's like number of configurations here. Just clear it out and just click that joint again. And it should work. And it, it, make sure you have this um, on the right drop down selection limits uh, so you can see that nothing is set up you can like this isn't set up for anything there's no limits on it you have to actually do it manually like this and set it up now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna clear this up and I'm gonna hit this come here hit this and come over here and just take that off <laughs> uh, that just computes the limits for you and I noticed that this will give you a general good limit it will create a limit for you by default as you can see here we already have a limit this cone it wasn't there before but now it is so it, it creates a nicely it's a good starting point I mean you still have to fix it up a bit but at least you you don't there's less things to do I'm just going to move that out of the way. Now let's hook the new, oops. Let's hook up our new configured joint limits and hook it up to full body IK. So I'm bypassing what I had before. This is the old one. Mm, let me move it up so you can have a better view. Because it's quite messy right now. Okay, let's move that out of the way. Just, just ignore that. Oh, come on! What? What? Okay. Full body at K. Let's do this. So we're bypassing what I had before, and with our new configured joint limit. Now this is just with the default limit uh, using that little trick of uh, uh, where is it? The, the compute limits for joints using the motion clip. Let's see what we get. Okay, I need to turn them around. It's throwing errors for no reason at all. Okay, let's try this again. So the hand is still going through it. But, so we do need to nudge it a bit. So we still need to do a bit more to the limit. So this default limit that was created, it's still not great. It's still not good enough. What I like to do is put the motion clip, your, put the render flag on the bone deform so you ac can actually see your character in person, the 3D character. Then come over to the configure joint Select the node and press enter so you can see both things. And then you can tweak it. Probably better if you have two views. Yeah, so this you can see the clip. This one, you can focus on the joint. 
Shift F1. Okay, so we can actually see the clip. So I can see the hand. And I'm going to uh, nudge this around. Okay, there, that's what the X is doing. So we, we don't want to touch that one. So what about if we did this? Okay, that's not helping. So then it, we're left with the Y. Or maybe it's a combination. So you have to like nudge it a bit. Over here. Okay, that did it. Okay, I think this would do it. So that makes it a bit easier because we already have most of it set up. You just have to adjust it a bit more. So let's see how this looks. Okay, let's play it from start. Oh, like this. So the hand looks okay. Yep. Okay, so that's much easier than doing it from scratch. Uh, so that's just putting a limit, uh, rotation limit. So that wasn't new. That's not new in Houdini 19. That's always been there. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let me look at some of these things. Leave. Uh, I'm going to wait for six months. 128 is a lot. 64 is actually pretty basic for simulations in Houdini. Like y if you have less than 64 gigs, it will be really hard. But I've had 64 gigs for a long time and I think it's it's time to if I really wanted to do large scale scene simulations, uh I think I will have to upgrade soon to like 128. But just FYI, for the Windows 10 Home Edition, there's a limit to 128 gigs it, if you add more ram into your computer and you have windows 10 home it's not it's just going to ignore it so you will have to upgrade to windows 10 pro and that i think it has two terabyte uh limit for the ram it supports up to two terabytes of uh ram a memory uh a but there's a huge but to this because windows 11 is coming out so that like that questions the value of upgrading at this moment if windows 11 is going to be stable in six months later then why get 10 now like why upgrade 10 now so that's something you have to judge for yourself if you need it now 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 then you know you, then you need to get it <laughs> but if you can wait then i would suggest that you would wait uh i just made a cute girl I don't know what that is. Sorry. I don't need more than 64. Uh, soon. Soon. You'll, you'll see. Houdini is like a uh, memory eater. <laughs> Let's see. Rodeska, wait till you start uh, dunking them in Vellum Goo. Yeah, that's true. It, Vellum, Vellum's not too bad with memory. But when you get into grains, particles, uh, fluid, um, those are all the memory eaters. Um... Pyro. Pyro Pyro's not too bad, I guess. Because the new most of the pyro scenes most of the pyro sims that I run, I prefer to simulate using GPU because it's so much faster. But the G I have there's a huge limit on the GPU memory I have. Like I have an RTX twenty eighty, so that has a limit of eight gigs. Like that's nothing. <laughs> So there's a lot of like stuff you need to be aware of. I think I'll leave uh to my goo guy. <laughs> Handle got uh fired from side effects for not working. Who? <laughs> That's one funky handle. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm lost. Uh yeah, giving me nineties UI vibes. You have the patience of a water bear. I would have tossed my computer out the window by now. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes uh sometimes pyro can do that to you or or large scale flip fluids. I I've, I've simulated with 1 million uh flip fluids before and then it was simulated for 6 hours and then it crashed. I'm like, "Oh no. I don't have enough memory to go past 200 frames." So that was like waste of time. That was back then, like years ago when I had before I got the RTX 20, before the RTX came out. 
Uh, toss my uh, I've been ruining your base meshes with my crappy blender sculpting and thought I'd give the new ZBrush a trial. Nothing in Houdini requires the patience of learning the ZBrush. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is true. ZBrush you, um, user interface is very unique. There's no, um, there's no pattern to it. Uh, you, but, 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 now I've been a ZBrush user longer than I have used Houdini. Um, I admit it is weird. <laughs> it's very unique. I believe, but once you start using it, like you use it a couple of times, it's very easy to remember. And the reason for that is I believe that the coder or the developer of ZBrush in Pixel Logic is prioritizing the the position of the keys on the keyboard. For example, most of the keys that you would use for brushes are on the left hand side of the keyboard. <laughs> so it, that prioritizes because you're usually sculpting with your right hand with the pen on your right hand. And so it was very smart that they were prioritizing the position of the keys. And it, it's, it has nothing to do with what makes sense or not. It's just which one is closer to which finger. But once you start using it, you'll find that it's very addictive and it's very easy to remember just because it's so close to the keys. It, it fits your hand it, or it fits the position of your the fingers and you know where it is. So it, it's easy to, uh, what's it called? Muscle memory, <laughs> it becomes. But it is weird. I, uh, sorry, it's unique. It's very unique. Um, oh, right. That was just configuring joint limits. What I really wanted to show you was the key pose extraction. So that wasn't even it yet. Um, okay. So now we have our second, uh, this is the second full body IK that we have here, which has the limit, the joint limit in it. I'm going to send this off to a motion clip. Now what this does, the motion clip really just takes the animation and it flattens it up. So now that once you have this motion clip, so if, if we go back to the frame, uh, full body IK, we drag the timeline, it's actually moving. But if we come to the motion clip node here and we drag the timeline, nothing is moving. And you can see on the frame, uh, on the viewport, that all the frames are displayed on the viewport, like some onion, unwrapping the onion uh unwrapping on every single frame like you, when you're doing 2d animation you you see the every frame unwrapped that's what the motion clip does it turns everything uh all the all the animation into sort of a graph like um data that allows houdini to calculate the entire animation all at once and that's what this uh motion clip extraction key pose so you type motion clip extraction that's this one this node will be used uh to sort of smooth out the animation and to remove some of the noise that was hanging on the head that i shown you on eric eric is the the rig this character rig he's eric eric it's so blurry. I can't even make it up. Wiz? Was? Wes. Is that an E? W-E-I-S-S? -S? Or W-O? Anyways. This guy's Eric. So the motion clip here. It What it does, uh, we have motion clips. So we have... Uh, okay, that doesn't help. I don't know how many frames are in here. Oh, let's see. frame rate frame okay that doesn't tell me i could just zoom this over so we have about 170 90 190 frames then it stops moving so that's that's when i know when the animation ends i have about 190 frames in here it takes this motion clip takes this and it filters it out it's sort of like interlacing it only picks 
uh, one frame out of, I don't know, oh, 20 frames here to as a, a key post. So we get rid of like 19 frames, I guess. Click this. So you can see that it's reduced significantly. We've lost a lot of frames. So that's how it does the smoothing. It just selects certain frames and removes the other ones. After you the do after you have um applied the motion clip, like whatever however you want to remove, you, you can specify up here in the key post. So if you want to remove uh keep more, jack up this this uh number up higher. This is the key post key certain very key elements that you want to keep. If you want to keep less, then that's more smoothing. I noticed that 20 worked out nicely for this animation, so I kept it at 20. So now we have extracted this or smoothed it out, we have to convert it back into a motion clip or uh, convert it back to the animation. So you need to drop down a motion clip evaluate and this will return it back to normal. As we can see here, we get our animation back. Then feed it into a joint deform. I believe you can still feed this into a, a bone deform. I think it'll still work. Let's actually try it. I never tried that. I think it's the same thing. Yeah, it looks like it's the same thing. Not sure the difference between bone deform and joint deform. I think the joint deform is quite new. I've never noticed the joint deform before Houdini 19. So this might be new or it might have been there the whole time and I just didn't notice it. <laughs> Could have been that. But either way, I don't... Oh, since... Houdini 19. Okay, so the joint deform is new. So it's brand new in Houdini 19. I'm not sure the difference between the joint deform and bone deform yet, but soon. Uh, I'm going to be looking more into the KinFX new features because I still have a, a list of things that I have to go over. For example, the ragdoll stuff I haven't had a chance to play around with. And the karma grooming for the hair. Uh, so those are still outstanding items. Uh, so that's the only thing for the key pose uh, extraction that I wanted to show you. The last one left is the pyro. So this one is really nice. This isn't much. Um, I didn't do much with it. But this has been made so simple. Let's see. Nice. Uh, I hate or helping. What? <laughs> Unique. Uh, what about left hand people? Yeah, that's the thing. I believe Pixelogic has an option to um, turn the controls, f uh, to change the controls for left hand for left handed l left handers. Uh, I can't wait to. Go more into un unravels. Sorry, what? <laughs> I posted a link uh, to all of the new updated nodes. I think it got caught in the spam filter. Oh, is that what this is? Yeah, I don't know. I I think links are filtered in the YouTube comments by default. It's not something I did. It, it's just there. The, it's just there by default. Um, also, motion clip extract key poses has a percentage mode. Oh, yeah, yeah, there is a percentage mode. Sorry. Uh, I, I, I'm going over this quite quickly since we're, we're getting into like two hours. <laughs> uh, the bone deform sop has been replaced by the joint deform sop. Oh, is that why? But it's still there. Bone deform is still there. And joint deform is still there. I don't know. Uh, from transitioning... Oh, okay. 
So this is going to be... It, they're sl slowly fading it away. I see. Okay, let's go over this last one I have. Pyro. Pyro is so easy in Houdini 19 now. Like, if you've ever worked with um, the Pyro shelf tools up here, uh, like some of this stuff over here, and they're kind of finicky to work with because you have to have the mouse in a specific position to get the shelf tools working. And a lot of people had a lot of trouble with it. I had a couple of tutorials on that. And there were so many questions on to why like, it didn't work. And I'm like, you know, put the mouse just a little to the left. I'm just kidding. The mouse has to be over, hanging over, hovering over the 3D viewport. And then you have to press enter and, and stuff like that. It's like a, it's like a video game. <laughs> Trying to get that thing to work. Now, there's a huge improvement in Houdini 19 with the pyro. Go into the shop, press pyro configure. So all this stuff is like, I believe they're newly added. All the configure pyro nodes here. This will set you up uh, will set up a fully functional pyro simulation right into your saw. Fully ready. So the one I was testing out was the fireball. So I'm just going to drop this down and you'll see what I mean. Just give it a second. Give it a second. Give it a second. There you go. Okay. So this completely ready to go. It, with just dropping down one, one, selecting one menu item. Now, let me just find it. Cook a few frames so I can actually see it. There you go. And it's relatively fast. So this is um, rendered in the viewport. So if you want nice colors. So this is the one that I uh, was playing around with. I It's the same fireball that you get from from tapping from the pyro configure fireball. It's the same setup there, but I have tweaked the parameters. So this makes it a lot faster, uh, speeds up your workflow by having something ready to go like from end to end already ready made. And then all you have to do is keep tweaking it. I mean, at the end, you might have replaced everything in the entire setup, but this makes it much faster uh, in your workflow. So I'm just going to delete this. And let's take a look at this one. This one is cached out. So I do have, uh, I have tweaked some of the s shadings. This is shaded right in the viewport. I find this amazing. Can't stop thinking about this. Shaded right in the viewport. It looks like it's something it's rendered out. And this is the pyro uh, bake volume, I believe it's called. Pyro bake volume. So here you can actually improve the visuals or shading, uh, material shading for the volume right in the viewport. This is something I can, I think, production, almost production ready. There is some things that you need to be aware of. In order to get your viewport to output a higher quality, high enough quality, you actually come, have to come to the settings, press like, hover the mouse over the viewport, <laughs> press D, and you're brought into your display options. So you have to pump up the settings in here. I just pump up everything related to the volumes. Uh, let's see, geometry, volume quality, set this to high, volume filtering on, occlusion, points uh vertex that's that's the only one there let's see hdr rendering uh, enabled um okay camera nothing there lights quality sensitivity material fog grid background Texture inside the texture. I pumped this up. The limit resolution for 3D textures. I added a zero behind this. So this was 128 times 128 times 128. I added a zero, so it's 1,000, 1,200, 1,200, 1,200. Uh, optimize. I believe there was a part to 
to turn it into full HDA, uh, HDR. Oh, here it is. HDR texture. So under textures here, HDR textures, full, full HDR, HDR textures, full HDR here. So I just turned everything up. <laughs> and then you can get, you'll notice that, oh, and inside the pyro bake volume, turn it up here as well. Max viz resolution. So this is in terms of voxels. Um, you have less this, you will notice that it'll be more, uh, it'll play back faster. Although, if you turn it off, I don't really see much difference. Like, I don't visually, I don't know, maybe it's my eyes. I don't really see it. But that might be, might also be tied to the number of uh, voxels in the simulation that I have. So if you want to, like, if you've noticed that you've turned up all the settings to and all the resolution and you turned up the max viz resolution over here and you're still not getting the quality that you like, try, sorry, I just wanted to stop the simulation so I can click something. Okay. Turn up uh, the resolution of your volume simulation itself. For example, in the pyro solver, turn up, uh, turn up the resolution for the voxel size. That means turning down this value. The smaller voxel size, the more resolution of your volume. Um, voxel size here inside the volume raster attributes. Just link these. I linked it all to. Oh, it's linked by uh by default if you use the the fireball pyro burst particle scale size velocity i think that's it i think that's the only spot in the volume raster is attribute and the pyro solver voxel size. So that should give you, if I jack this up to one, 0 0.01, it would give me a much better resolution in the volume simulation. Combined with the material and um, and the fact that you have this turned up in uh, the max viz resolution turned up enough to handle the volume simulation that you're trying to set a material for. So they all have to match up in order to maximize your resolution. But you need to be aware of this. As you're turning this up, it'll slow down everything as well. Uh, let's see. Manual dropping down a bunch of nodes is freaky darn. <laughs> it is very handy. Let's see. They usually two nodes at the same time. A bunch of people would get confused if they couldn't find the original. That's true. That that has happened to me at the beginning. Well, when I started just started in Houdini, I didn't know what was what. Um, some people don't read the uh, change reports, which is why I'm here because I don't read. <laughs> I didn't read it either. <laughs> just just play around with it. <laughs> just play around. Try it. <laughs> That's my best uh advice. Try it. If you don't know what happens, give it a try. What's the worst that can happen? Um, and just dropping down for you, just like uh, vellum. Uh, we all love vellum, though. It doesn't matter if you, it's dropping down a bunch of uh, vellum nodes. We still love it. <laughs> Viewport shading better than redshift volumes. Oh, seriously? <laughs> That'd be amazing. But this is really handy. That's for sure. It's nice to have it within the viewport. Uh, you can edit a lot of nice things in the lights tab if your GPU is good enough. Yeah. If I added some lights to the scene, I think this would have been nicer. But because this is the fireball, it's emitting light anyways. I, I didn't think much of it. Uh, push 8024 override light map size to 2048 light sampling max light samples 4000. Wow. That sounds expensive to to render. Take it sounds like it'll take forever to render. Uh, also, tr running Aces or OCIO, your highlights are clipping horrendously. <laughs> Sorry, setting up Aces using Open Color IO Pyro sounds intense. 
How would you approach rotating a curve point normal? Curve point normal. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, but why a curve? <laughs> I know how to rotate a normal, but not sure about a curve. Uh, rotate. It's not easy though. It's actually something I learned from from CG Wiki. It it uses a bit of vex though to rotate to rotate normal. If I can find it, rotate vector. Hmm. Somewhere around here, there is rotate vector. Uh, CG Wiki had a part where they teach you using how to use vex code to rotate a vector. Okay, I can't find it. <laughs> uh, the last time I rotated a vector, I used a lot of trigonometry. Uh, but I don't remember it offhand. What you could do Instead of rotating the vector, you can have two things. Like, you can cheat. I have a bunch of ways to cheat. <laughs> Oops. Have a sphere here, and then have another sphere there. Take this all the way. Oh, turn it up. Up, 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 up. Uh, put a line struct. Extract this. Extract that. Merge. Eh? Merge. Okay, then I have two points. And then I'm just gonna fake this. Zero one, so I have a line, and then I can just move this sphere. Uh, uh. There we go. And you can move this sphere, and then you have the this line that points wherever you want. So this line is now you can uh you have a direction, so you have the normals basically. <laughs> Uh, to twist, how would you do that? to twist a section of the curve for sweeps? Oh, orientation mode, a node, uh, twists, transform node attribute set to n. Uh, overview this node computes orientations known as known as reference frames based on the tangents of the curves with various options for specifying up vectors and additional rotations. What's up, bubble pins, Mark? Uh, overview of this node computes. I am not sure about that. I think it's under Vex. Uh, CG Vicky Vex intro. I think so too. Just can't find it on hand right now. Just uh, got my first job in technical artist. I started Monday. Oh, congrats, Mark. Congratulations. That's exciting. Check out the orientation along curve node for loop each. Oh yeah, that would work. Orientation along curve. Hmm. Let's add a curve. Doink, 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 doink. Something like that, okay. Uh, sample. Uh, polyframe, was it? I need... 
edge forces. It used to be in the point slot, but they they took out that node. Um, so now I need to use this. I'm not sure if it's working though. <laughs> Primitive points. Is it actually working? Okay, so I'm getting edge. You can see that little tiny thing. I'm getting edge. Uh, the normals are pointing in the direction of the curve. Uh, what else do I need? Curves here. Banking curves. Banking curves. Curves along orientate along curve. Curves. I think you put a. Let's put the rubber toy. I think that's what it is. Nope. Orientate along curve. Curve normals points up. Axes. Curve group. Banking curves. Curves. Uh. When in doubt, look at the sample. <laughs> Let's see what they do. Load. So any of you um, that don't know, uh, a small FYI, if you don't know how to use one of the nodes, um, select it, come to the little help icon on the top right hand corner of the uh, parameter window. So I have my parameter window. Uh, placed nicely over here, which you can call up using P. Uh, if you press P on the keyboard, and there's this little help icon, press it, and then it'll bring you with some documentation. Sometimes it will also have some examples, which you can load directly into Houdini, which is awesome. This is very handy. and But it'll place it randomly on the highest level of the object uh, platform context. So you have to like search for it. Tread bank. So let's see how they use this. I actually don't know. Okay. Uh, let's see what they have. Wheel. Carve. Okay, so they have the curve. They created a curve like that. Resample. Okay, let's see the normals. They're all pointing in one direction. Animate, tread, play for it. Okay, that's just for animation. Uh, orient along curve oh I think the orient along curve is the edge force <laughs> it's what I was doing oh that's what this thing does and then you just copy it over okay I understand so silly so when I added the this polyframe and I placed the end in here that's what the orient does so we, I don't need the polyframe. Let's take this here. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at the end now. Where's the end? That's, I, that's what I thought it was doing. Curved node, axes. Oh, I think it needs a curve by default first though. points so, nope oh it is pointing in the same direction sorry it's just overlapping the it's just overlapping with the line so that's why we can't see it is placing it there that's why the line is turning blue when i click this it's very faint i don't know if you can see it it's right there uh here let me blast let me blast everything but the the points then you can see okay there you can see the normals oh but the normals are too long now you can't see that okay i still i can i, I can still do this <laughs> i can still do this i got this normal come here marker let me make this smaller oh sorry that didn't really do anything Okay. There we go. Okay, let's point five. Okay, there you go. There's the normal. So what I just did. So the normals are there. That that's what this orient curve does. 
which was uh, what I was, it, which is the edge force. It's where it points towards the curve. Now you got stuff pointing in the right direction. I was doing, I was always using the poly frame for that because the poly frame has the tangent name, which you can just substitute the end for and then stuff. <laughs> It'll just work the same way. Uh, whoa. Where'd I go? Check out the curve. Trying, uh, first TD job. That's a big step. It is. Congratulations, Mark. Oh, thanks, man. You can rotate normal points by using transform node set to end. Oh, let's give that a try. Transform at n. Can we do that? Let's see. Let's try rotating. I'm not sure if that actually works. Or how do you do this? Recompute point normals. Invert. Oh, that didn't do it. Transform. Hmm, not sure. I'll put attribute. rotating everything. Okay, I don't know. Cheers, BP. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, but I want to control it manually for each point, because I'm not making a lot of them. It would just be random. Uh, is it possible? I would use the curve to control it, because the curve, we have so much updates to the curve node now. The curve node is awesome. So you can just drop down the curve and then to in order to change the point of the normal just change the curve position for example uh let's go like this let's go like this that would change all the points in this part of the curve for these two sections of the curve now we we should have normals pointing like this. So you can sort of use the curve to help you change uh, the point normals. I don't know if that, that that that's good enough for you. Oh my god, I'm diverting stream so hard. No, I'm, I'm actually almost like, we're done. Pyro was the last thing I had on my list. Well, not, uh, I still had the cobwebs, uh, the spider webs, but I'm getting really tired. I might just release that. <laughs> just throw it out into the world. Uh, give me one second. I'm going to get a glass of water. Mm, that's what you wanted. To be able to individually rotate point normals. Uh, orientation along curve will generate nice transforms. Along each point along the curve. Now, how do I make that into a tool for a viewport? HDA, HDA will be your uh, good friend. And the additional rotation sections will let you control it quite a bit. The fine grain, but the orientation node for for loop. Uh, whoa, sounds... That will work. Sounds like it'll work. See the yaw on the node. Maybe use curved U ramp to adjust normals. Oh, that's actually a better idea. Ooh, where did it go? Here. Oh, uh, there's Rome twist. That's quite complete. Resample with curved U. Uh, for each, puts a single value on all of them, even if cycling once uh, through. Oh, you need to change. If you're using uh, for each point in the point in the for each end part, merge each iteration or feedback each iteration. So merge each iteration will create uh, another copy of whatever your input is. If you're inputting a sphere into this for loop and you have merge each iteration, it will like 10 times, it will give you 10 spheres at the end. But if you have feedback each iteration, it just goes like, okay, one sphere going in the for loop once, same one, same sphere, same single one sphere twice, 
three, four, five. In the end, you'll have one sphere. So that's what feedback is. Uh, usually gets your curve ready. I want to select one point, rotate normal, and then do the same. Looks like a tool, not a viewport. Yes, you can. Right, roll, twist, curve. Not sure the transform issues. Wow, this is a lot of comments on that. Uh, the matrix transform. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> okay. I how about this? In the next stream, I'll have a special on how to, or maybe I'll come up with a, an HDA on how to transform a, a point, the normals on the point. If that if that helps everyone, because it sounds like this is something that people might use. I can hear the grains flood a fluid going down your throat and it's maddening interesting <laughs> i'm sorry i'm really thirsty <laughs> that that's how hap that happens when you talk for two and a half hours <laughs> super tired i'm gonna be losing myself soon and i'm still wondering if i should go over the cobwebs the spider web generator i had that i maybe i'll save that for tomorrow i'm super tired <laughs> please uh just for the love of god add a transform and in the attribute field right and select a point and rotate it okay <laughs> will do i've actually never done this before i didn't know you can actually rotate a single point uh points and is not a valid group though uh, attribute n. But I believe. Does it actually work? Because I remember I just tried it. It doesn't seem like it's rotating. The normal is on the points. Also, man, I'll try that uh, in the attribute field. The transform attribute field. In the the what? <laughs> Oh, here. Wow, I'm blind. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I can just hear everyone yelling at me. <laughs> oh, you're right. That's pretty neat. Wee. Oh, that didn't work. <laughs> sorry. Time save 60. Oh, that took it all up. Dollar sign F times 10 times through 60. Oh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I did not notice the pre-transform. So under the pre-transform, there's this attributes drop down. You can actually add attributes in here and transform the attributes. There. I never knew that. <laughs> I never even um looked down here. <laughs> I've always focused my eyes on up here. I always thought y you had um, that people were talking about up in the group here, in the group parameter. But there's actually an attribute parameter. Awesome. I'll try that in the attribute field. You keep typing N in the group. Select a point in the group. Go down to the attribute. <laughs> I am sorry. I can I can hear people uh, yelling through the comments. <laughs> That was very silly of me. I, I am I am sorry. I'm blind. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> now let's celebrate. You can select individual points and rotate them this way. And as uh, many transforms as needed. Uh, Multi-parameter plus HDA viewport tool. You still need a viewport tool? <laughs> Rent. Much love. 
Um, but do I have to add another transform each time? Hmm. I'm not sure. It depends on what you want to do, I guess. If you want to make a transform, rotate it on top of another rotation. Yes, but you can add them procedurally with basic Python. You take 30 minutes. Learn how to Google if OD force. Each time I want to rotate a single point. Just wanting to know. Backseat gamers. <laughs> All right, I know coding, but not who did it yet. And if you need um, to mass control normals and tangents along a curve or mass of curves, please have fun with orientation along curves. So I resemble that remark. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, I learned a lot. I don't know about you. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. I hope everyone has found this stream interesting. I have. I never noticed this attributes. This is actually very handy, though, to, to rotate it, the N over here. I've always been doing it with Vex, using, like, tips and, like, stupid little tricks, like, with a sphere and rotating the sphere instead. So I've always been using tricks like that to rotate stuff, which is quite complex. This is much easier. This will come in uh, very handy, and I can see myself using this in the future. Uh, cool. So I just, I think I'm going to end the stream. Just because I don't know about you guys, we've had a long stream. I'm super tired. I will uh, go on my journey and keep discover pl keep playing around with houdini 19 on these next topics and hopefully they'll be ready for the next stream actually the next stream i might i really want to get uh go over the spider webs generated that i have or i might just just throw it out <laughs> throw it out into the world <laughs> without a video tutorial <laughs> and then but this will this will be coming soon this stuff so, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining me today, and it's been great. It's been really fun, and hope everyone learned something. I know I have. So, happy Houdini, and see you next time.